Well, well, well. Look who's got around to posting videos again. <clears throat> oh, well, and so it's a warm welcome to the first episode in a new series for calculating pi on my relay computer. And yeah, it's going to be a bit of a challenge this one. So um, where to start? Well, firstly, if you're new to my channel, then hello. My name is Paul and I've been foolhardy enough to try and build a computer out of relays. And to be fair, actually, I've not done too bad to date. This is what I've built so far, and if you're curious to know more, I've got an overview series that explains the architecture, design, construction and demonstrates running a simple program, links in the description below. If you don't fancy adding that to your watch list though, no problems, feel free to keep watching here as I'll be aiming to make this series as accessible as possible and try and explain things as we go. As you might expect though, we'll be delving into binary calculations and quite a bit of a programming, but hopefully that's exactly the sort of thing that you're looking for. Now if you're a returning viewer and enjoyed my previous videos then, welcome back, I'm guessing you maybe have some questions. Maybe something along the lines of, why now? Why pi? And where the hell have you been for the last couple of years? Well I'll tackle those questions in reverse order I think, and truth is, building a relay computer is a labour of love and requires dedication, commitment, time, effort, money, sweat, blood, tears, etc etc. Moreover, you've got to be really, really into it, and well, I've just not been feeling it lately, and therefore all my other hobbies have jumped ahead of this. Poor relay computer, waiting patiently there gathering dust, waiting for its turn on the hobby list. What it needed was something to spark my interest again, be the thing that I ponder over in the shower, the thing that gives me indigestion because I'm rushing dinner to get back to problem solving, the thing that gets my inner geek going again. And so a few weeks back, I'm checking in on my YouTube comments, and this one catches my eye. And there's the spark I needed. I had an initial think and realised I've genuinely no idea how I'd go about calculating pi, but I'm pretty sure my computer can do it. And sure, I've also no idea how I'll get my computer to play Crisis either, but the pi thing, that sounds reasonably within reach, and something I might well enjoy doing. And so? Challenge accepted. And so here we are. And this has been a pretty meaty one so far, something for me to really get my teeth into. That's meant lots of research, experimentation and learning loads of new things, which is always a nice treat, and that's also good for keeping the commitment levels up. Now I'm mixing tensors a bit here, but as it stands I've done just enough work to be comfortable I can achieve the challenge, but that's about it. In fact, this video pretty much covers everything I've done to date, and I've only really got a rough idea of how this series will progress. But all being well, it should culminate in a working demonstration, and I suspect I'm going to need to build some new functionality, including that tape reader, as the program to calculate pi, it's not the sort of thing I want to enter by hand. Right, enough intro, let's get going, and I'm going to start at the end. We're going to calculate 20 decimals of pi, so let's start with a look at the solution. And here it is, the goal of this challenge. This is the number my computer needs to calculate. Hopefully pi itself needs no introduction, but in summary it's the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, and it's a constant value that crops up all over the place in mathematics and physics. Curiously, its decimal representation never ends, and it doesn't appear to enter any permanently repeating pattern either. Calculating the value of pi has a long and interesting history, and to this day the quest to find more and more digits of pi is very much alive. The record currently stands in the trillions of digits, but I think 20 will do for us, yeah? And actually 20 is more than you get in most places. Uh, by day I work in software development, mainly with Microsoft.net, and so here's their version of Pi. The precision of Pi here is constrained by the underlying data type used to store it, and that's a common theme on computers across the board. You need somewhere to store the value if you're going to use it. And in this case, that's as much precision as will fit in a .NET 8-byte floating-point double type. And .NET is being extra generous here. Try it on a regular pocket calculator and you'll likely get far less precision. For most practical calculations, pi at this precision is plenty enough. And there's a great paragraph I found on Wikipedia that puts this all into context. The accuracy of pi necessary to calculate the circumference of the observable universe to a precision of one atom, you ready for this, is 39 digits. So for most practical purposes you don't need many digits, 
and even 3.14 will cover most cases. Now you could argue that taking pi to lots of decimal places is more of an intellectual pursuit than a practical one. And that's fine and fair in my view. Sometimes you do stuff just for the love of the subject. And many, many clever mathematical minds have calculated pi exactly on that basis. So with all that context under our belts, let's move on. Now I'm assuming that if I just copy paste the value of pi here into my computer, that might be considered cheating and would make for a refreshingly short series of videos. So how do we go about calculating it instead? Well, let's focus on pi as a number again. Pi is an irrational number, which is to say it can't be expressed exactly as a ratio of two integers. On the other hand, a rational number, for example 0.25, a quarter, it's 3 over 4. 3 divided by 4, precisely, no approximation, no rounding. Pi doesn't work that way, but you can pick a rational number that's close enough for day-to-day -day purposes. For example, 22 over 7, 333 over 106, and if you're really going for it, there's this one. Now there's a couple of even bigger ones, but the point is they're nearly pi, but not actually pi. They can't be pi. Pi is an irrational number. So could I use a rational approximation of pi? Well, that still comes under the cheating category for me here. We're supposed to be calculating pi, not estimating it. So if we can't define pi as a ratio of two integers, then how do we define it? Well, something true of every real number, including pi, is that they can be defined by an infinite series of nested fractions, like so. In fact, that's exactly where those fractional approximations, like 22 over 7 and 333 over 106, came from. We're just stopping the infinite series early. Now this definition probably looks a tad busy, but think of it this way. Take our value of pi at the bottom of the screen there. Well, that's just 3, plus 1 over 10, plus 4 over 100, plus 1 over 1,000, plus 5 over 10,000, and so on. So could we use this as our basis for calculating pi? Well, no, that's cheating again, because we already know the digits. All we're doing is putting them in the right place. We'll need this number to confirm our calculation is correct though, so I might well store this in memory for that purpose, but we mustn't use it for calculating pi. So we need a formula then, and preferably one that doesn't just have the digits of pi already in it. Pi is a transcendental number as well as an irrational one, which is to say it can't be defined by a finite algebraic equation. No matter what, we're going to be looking at a formula involving infinite series. And it's really just a question of how quickly that formula arrives at an accurate value of pi to our desired precision. Luckily, I'm not the first person trying to derive an infinite series for pi, so let's start with a nice easy one. This is the Gregory Leibniz series. You can hopefully see the pattern here, and with each further term added to the sum, the total gradually gets closer and closer to the value of pi. But just how gradually are we talking about here? Well, it's actually quite slow to converge, and even after 5,000 terms, it's still only correct to four decimal places. If you want your pi delivered quicker, then we'll need something a bit more... involved. Like this, perhaps. Now, the pi aficionados out there may have noticed I've jumped forward a couple of centuries. This formula dates back to 1914, and comes from the Indian mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujan. Interestingly, this isn't his only one. He published this amongst dozens of other new and elegant formula for calculating pi, kicking off and inspiring new research on rapidly converging pi formulas. Speaking of convergence, one iteration of this formula gets you pi correct to six decimal places. Go for a second iteration and you've got pi correct to 14 decimal places. So this could be the formula I need, but whoa, just look at this thing. There's some pretty big numbers in there, and look, there's even an exclamation mark in it to show you just how challenging it is to compute. I'm joking, of course. Or maybe I'm not. Those exclamation marks, they're factorials. So by way of example, let's focus on the 4k factorial here. With k at 0, we get 0 factorial, which is 1, simple enough. With k at 1, we get 4 factorial which is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. OK, seeing a pattern here? With k at 2, we get 8 factorial, 
which is 8 times 7 times 6 and so on down to 1, totalling 40,320. Mm -hmm. By the fourth iteration, we're at 12 factorial, with a value of 479,000,600. So yeah, pretty big numbers. Now luckily we wouldn't have to iterate this formula too far for the result we need, but wouldn't it be so much better, and bear with me here, if there was some sort of magic tap where you turn it on and the digits of pi come flowing out, digit by digit, one at a time. No, it's not time for my medication. I'm talking about spigot algorithms. This is the bailey borwein plouffe formula, or BBP for short, and it's relatively recent, in math terms at least, being discovered in 1995. On every iteration of the formula, the sum will be accurate to one more digit of pi. And doesn't the formula just look so elegantly simple? Mostly just addition, subtraction, division, and look at the constants. All powers of 2, which just happens to be my relay computer's favourite. There's going to be a catch though, right? Well, yeah, those powers of 2 are hiding an important property of this formula. The value this formula is producing? It's not in base 10. It's not decimals coming out of it. This formula produces a value for pi in base 16, like so. This is pi in hexadecimal, with each digit between 0 and 15. The values 10 through to 15, they get represented with letters A, B, C, D, E and F. So this doesn't look much like the version of pi we're accustomed to, but they're the same value. Well, they're very nearly the same value, because as we'll see in the moment, we need to be really careful when converting one to the other. What's so appealing about this formula though, is its binary friendliness makes it a good fit for my relay computer. Now, I should pause here and mention that this isn't actually a spigot algorithm, uh, but one can be derived from it. With that derived algorithm, you can calculate, say, the thousandth digit of pi, without having to calculate the sum of pi up to that point. Why is that useful? Well, the formula shown isn't the quickest way of calculating pi, but the spigot version is quick at getting the nth digit of pi, which means you can use it to validate other pi algorithms, which have to sum up from zero. The BBP spigot isn't as useful to us here though, because, as we'll see, you need all the preceding hexadecimal digits to convert back to decimal. So in our case, the formula shown works well for us, and it's the one I think I'm going to go with. And that's not to say we're home and dry. There's some hidden complexity in fractional numbers which we need to consider. If these were all positive integers, there's no problem, as there's a hex value for every decimal value, and vice versa. But something odd happens when you try and represent fractions in computers. So let's start with some decimal examples. Hopefully it's straightforward enough to say that any decimal number is made up of 1s, 10s, 100s and so on, and as you go left you increase in powers of 10. It follows that as you go right of the decimal place you decrease in powers of 10, so tenths, one hundredths and so on. So let's try some division. 14 divided by 8, and let's try it without a calculator for old time's sake. 8 goes into 14 once, with 6 left over. Take that over, and 8 goes into 60 7 times, with 4 left over. Take that over, and 8 goes into 40 5 times, and we're done. So, 14 divided by 8 is 1.75. Or, looking at it another way, 1 plus 7 tenths plus 5 hundredths. And to be fair, that's probably the first time I've divided something by hand since school. So, while we're pushing the limits of mathematics, let's do another one. An even easier example, perhaps. 1 divided by 5. Well, 5 into 1 doesn't go, so we carry the 1, and then 5 into 10 goes twice. So 0.2 or 2 tenths. So, what happens if we try and represent this in binary? What does that look like? Well, similarly to decimal, we go up in powers to the left. And for binary, that's powers of 2. So 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s, and so on. So our decimal 14 is represented by an 8, a 4, a 2, and no 1s. 8 plus 4 plus 2 is 14. 
8 is even easy to represent, just a single 8 and nothing else. But what about 1.75 in binary? Well likewise, as we go right of the binary point, we go down in powers of 2. And yeah, that's a binary point here, not a decimal point. So 1.75, well that's 1 1, 1 half and 1 quarter. And it follows that 1 plus a quarter plus a half is 1 and 3 quarters, or 1.75. OK, that doesn't seem too bad then, but have you spotted the looming problem yet? Binary representation of a 1 and 5 is no problem, and as mentioned earlier, every positive decimal integer has an exact binary equivalent. But what about those fractional parts? We need two tenths. Well, let's rejig things here a bit. And we'll do this by trying to spread the 0.2 over the binary fractions we have available. Firstly, we have 1 half, 0.5. Well, that's more than 0.2, so there's no halves here. Quarters, or 0.25, still too high, so no quarters. Eighths, 0.125. Ah, well, we can take that off. So with 1 eighth taken care of, we're left with 0.075. Sixteenths, 0.0625, yep, there's one of those, and that gets us down to 0 0.0125. 1 over 32, that's 0 0.03125, and we're too big again. And there's me thinking 1 divided by 5 was the easier example. If we kept going with this, we'd actually find that we can't exactly represent 0 0.2 in binary. We can get closer and closer the more places we add to the binary fraction, but we'll never reach it exactly. This is the problem with binary fractions, and it gives computer programmers all sorts of headaches. For example, if I divide 1 by 10, it's 0 0.1, right? Well, binary can't represent a tenth exactly either. So then, what's 1 divided by 10 times 10? It's 1, yeah? Well, not with binary because we've lost precision en route, and now when you add it back up again, you get nearly 10, but not quite. Near enough that you can round the value to 10, but it's something you need to be careful with when handling fractional numbers in computers. The workaround for this in most computer languages is there's floating point types that handle fractions, similar to what's used here, and then there's decimal types which store the number as a binary integer. So here for 0 0.2, you store it as a 2, and then store that that value is 10 times what it should be alongside. This is crucial for financial calculations where you don't want dollars or cents going walkabouts, but computers can typically do floating point math much quicker. And if, for example, you're rendering a 3D game, you don't have to be precise about where a pixel will land. Rounding is fine. So what's all this got to do with calculating pi? Well, using the BBP formula, we'll be getting a fixed point binary value out the other side. My relay computer has no concept of fixed point binary numbers in the same way it has no concept of negative numbers. Everything is just a 1 or a 0, and all the arithmetic and logic operations it can do, well, they're just done on 8-bit values. That means that as the programmer, we need to handle all that and keep track of where we're placing our binary point in any given span of 8-byte values. So, where have we got to? We know the value of pi that we're trying to calculate. We've got a formula that I think is going to give us a good shot of calculating pi on my relay computer, albeit the value of pi we'll get will be in base 16. So I'm going to end it there for this video. For the next video, I want to be sure this formula is going to work. And to be fair, make sure I understand it properly and know what I'm getting myself into. The best way for me to do that is to use the tools available to me which for me as a programmer is going to be Microsoft.net. And so I'll write a program that will prove out calculating pi and converting it back and forth between decimal and binary. With that, we'll have a nice solid foundation knowing this is all computable. And then it's just working out how to do it on a relay computer, which doesn't even know how to divide or multiply. But that's for next time. And for now, thank you for watching. See you soon.